Uh, welcome to the second in the series of First Draft Live events hosted by Global Newsrooms and broadcast live online. Today we are being hosted by the New York Times, so welcome to everybody in the room, welcome to everybody online. Um, this is going to be a very kind of dynamic session with three speakers from the First Draft Coalition who are all going to go through some tips and techniques for verification. The topic of the, um, of the session is trusting social sources, but intermingled with all that we've got social discovery um, we've got some some you know different points of reference of case studies and investigations that everyone's worked on um, so we hope that if you're watching online that you'll submit some questions that i can put to the speakers uh, we'll also be taking some questions in the room and it's going to be quite a fast-paced event so we're very happy for you to join us before we get started i'm just going to tell you a little bit about first draft hmm. i've been told that if you do this and point it but I probably should be pointing it somewhere else. Marvellous. Um, so, First Draft came together in the middle of last year. So we're a coalition of organisations that uh, kind of prioritise the sort of standards and raising awareness around social news gathering and verification, predominantly around eyewitness media. So this kind of social content that emerges online and the challenges and opportunities that that presents. Um, so today we have Joe Galvin from Storyful. We have Claire Wardle from the Eyewitness Media Hub, but she's also the research director here at the Tau Centre at Columbia University, and Craig Silverman from BuzzFeed, who is also representing Emergent on the coalition. Um, so First Draft News is our website. So this was kind of when we first started, this is what we thought would be a useful thing to provide the industry. We would become like a one-stop shop uh, where we would host a series of case studies and reports and articles and kind of industry insights into things that are changing, any new tools that are coming along, to kind of guide people through some of the ethical challenges, some of the logistical challenges, how you find this content, how you verify it, how you then publish it, some of the ethics surrounding that. Um, so if you do anything today, then make sure you bookmark the site um, where you can come back and see some of these um, things that we talk about. So the articles that we've kind of covered in the past include, for example, highlighting a video verification project called Invid. Um, doing some really basic quick resources for how to use Google Earth, for example, for geolocation, like a two-minute watch. Um, we've discussed the rise of chat apps and you know, the challenges presented by eyewitness media that emerges on those. Uh, we do a kind of quick guide to copyright law. So anything that's relevant to this space, we're going to be talking about today, but also you'll find further articles about that online. Uh, that literally is, that, that's it from me. Um, I'm going to hand over to Adam Ellick, who is our kind of host for the day from the New York Times, just to welcome the online viewers and maybe talk a little bit more about what's happening here. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Jenny. So, um, thanks for coming, everyone. The, as most of you know, the Times has uh, quite a bit of ambition around user-generated content. Uh, with the launch of the Express team uh, in about a year, year and a half ago, and now with the relaunch of the video team, um, just in the past few months, we've had um, some pretty exciting stories that we were able to find across the social web and sort of wrap Times journalism around them in terms of verification and vetting. Uh, one was the uh, eyewitness video footage that uh, John Woo edited uh, on the killing of Farkunda, which told the story of an Afghan woman who was falsely accused of burning the Koran and was uh, recently a, a winner of the Pulitzer Prize. Um, and that video was made entirely of user-generated content. And then um, on a breaking news example that I want to highlight is one that Deba Costa made uh, right after the Paris attacks called The Improbable Survivor. And she was able, uh, just from here in New York and over social media, to uh, use some eyewitness footage and get original audio um, from uh, France and sort of stitch together a survivor account of um, that famous footage that most of you have probably seen of uh, the woman hanging from the windowsill outside of the uh, Bataclan Theater. So um, we're really excited to sort of push this forward. and. Um, create videos um, like this on a more consistent basis. But of course, with all um, opportunities comes some risk. And I couldn't help but sitting in on the morning session and realizing that um, there was a segment about hoaxes um, and, and pranks, uh, people out there who were trying to fool the press. And it reminded me of uh, a man who some of you may remember named Alan Abel, who used to 
uh, made a career out of trying to fool newspapers, I believe in the 70s or something, and would put out fake press releases and see how many stories he could get um, published, uh, fake stories. And um, in some ways, a lot of this stuff uh, just mirrors and reflects what we do every day um, or what we did every day in the most oldest school of newsrooms. So learning to verify and vet this stuff um, is as important as ever, even if the process and the tools and the methodology changes. Um, so we're looking forward to digging in, not just today, but um, using this as a way to really get started on improving our skills. And on that note, uh, they're very modest and will probably not tell you a lot about their backgrounds and they'll jump right into the training, but we are really um, honored and privileged to have First Draft here and especially Claire who has been, is, is actually a legend in this space and has been pioneering it since 2007, two, two, 2007, is that correct? Around that, time. Around that time, which probably means 2006, um, when you know it wasn't part of the, the mainstream vocabulary of news organizations and she was pushing it in newsrooms um, at a time when no one could even speak your language. Um, and also Jenny, who um, has been her partner in crime and um, sort of, you know, how to use this stuff responsibly and um, working with newsrooms around the world. So uh, we're quite honored to have someone who's been ahead of our users um, for years now. Um, so, and everyone else. So thanks for attending and enjoy. very much. Uh, I feel a little embarrassed now that I haven't prepared such a glowing introduction for Joe Galvin, who is magnificent in every way. How's that? Uh, who is going to come up now and talk to you about social discovery. So um, if you're watching online, this, well, all of the presentations today are fantastic. Um, in each case, pen and paper, iPad, however you, you do it, take the links down, take notes down of all the tools. You know, in each of these things, we're going to fly through them pretty quickly. Um, but the opportunity is there for you then to explore further. Um, and obviously, if you do have questions, again, um, post them using FD Live. Um, but I don't know how long Joe's been at Storyful. Maybe he can, he can tell you. But he, I think, is one of the founding newsroom members. Not quite. So from, from the very early days, when obviously, you know, being the first social media newsroom um, and kind of leading the way on how, you know, the discovery was something that none of us had seen before in terms of how on earth was, was this content just emerging and, and, and being able to, be, to find it as quickly um, as Storyful were able to find it in those early days means that Joe is probably one of the best people um, in the world to speak about social discovery. Um, so on that note, come up, Joe, and uh, show what you can do. <laughs> Hello, folks. It's good to be here. As Jenny mentioned, I'm the news editor with Storyful, where I've worked for almost five years now. And what I'm going to talk about is the first steps you need to take to find original video content as a story emerges. So what do you do in that first five, 10 minutes? As a story breaks, what are the steps we need to take as a team to find that content? Um, I'm going to start with a, hopefully start with uh, a rundown of organization of, of your team. So when a story breaks, it can be very easy to kind of lose the run of what's going on. You know panic can ensue. Something like Brussels happens, it's the biggest story in the world, you've got to cover it, but you also need to be organized and you need to be ready and have all your players in the right slots to ensure that you're covering the story as best as you can. Um, so where possible, you need to delegate responsibilities to your team. Um, at Storyful, and obviously at Storyful is a somewhat unique case, but we assign specific platforms to specific journalists. Um, for example, for a three-person team, let's take a three-person team, we have the lead person, in other words, the editor on shift, uh, we have the lead person on Twitter or TweetDeck. We have one person on Facebook, Instagram, and I'll cover why one person is doing that shortly. And we have one person on YouTube, Reddit, and local live blogs. The last thing you want to do is, with a small team, get into a situation where two journalists or two or more journalists are looking at the same video, doing the same work. Before you know it, you've lost 30 minutes, 45 minutes, you're behind. You've missed out on other great content. Um, and it can very easily happen in a breaking news situation. So have a process in place that you know, you know what slot you're going to fit into when a, when a news, uh, news story breaks. In breaking news confusion spreads quickly, so ensure you organize your team roles quickly. Better to have them pre-arranged before a story breaks. And regroup regularly. Um, I think at New York Times, you guys use Slack to communicate. 
At Storyful, we also use Slack, but we use it in conjunction with Google Hangouts. So we have a 24 hours a day, seven days a week Google Hangout. All journalists who are on shift at Storyful, and obviously we have a small team, all journalists who are on shift are on that Hangout. And if we need to communicate urgently something that's happening, it's very easy to get a voice communication going with our team in New York, Hong Kong, Sydney, Atlanta, wherever they may be. But using it in conjunction with Slack enables you to respond very, very quickly to, to issues as they emerge. So first of all, Twitter lists, absolute basic, but very, very important. If you do not have access to a Twitter list relevant to the event as a story breaks, you need to find or make one quickly. Ideally, you need to make one. You need to continuously add sources to the list as they emerge, and you need to identify the official sources. It's very easy to add plenty of sources to a list, but unless you have the official sources, sources that are putting out information you can use to inform your reporting, in other words, police, ministries, political figures, you're going to be lost in a, in a kind of... Uh, a, a maze of, of misinformation. So most news organizations have access to lists, but sometimes news breaks in an area infrequently covered. For example, something might happen in Mali. You don't necessarily have a list of uh, people there. But if you want to find a list very quickly, a good little tip is to open a prominent local account. And the example I hear in the right is Ryan Heath, who's based in Brussels for political. Open his account, add forward slash memberships to the URL, and you get a list of lists that that person is on. You can very, very quickly scroll through, find a Brussels list that he's on, take all the members of that list and put it on your own list, you know, go through it. And it's just a very, very quick tip to, to find a relevant and useful list in the initial stages of a breaking news story. Again, I stress, always better to create your own list as you have then control over that list. You can add, you can remove people from it as merited. Um, but if you don't have time to do that, that's a good tip to, to follow. So TweetDeck is a tool that most journalists or many journalists who work in uh, social media use these days. But there's a couple of things you need to do in the immediate uh, five, 10 minutes after a breaking news story uh, emerges. And what you need to do is um, set up, thank you, set up uh, searches for, let's say you're looking for video content. It's a very simple process to set up your tweet deck um, to search for related video content that matches specific keywords or geolocations. So what you're looking for is a related vocabulary. So if it's something happening in, let's take the Brussels um, attacks, you want you know, Mailbeck Metro Station, for example, you're gonna put Mailbeck in as a, as a keyword. You want hashtags, you want place names multilingual. So if it's in the Arabic speaking world, you're gonna use Arabic place names, obviously. You want the names of people involved, if there's some significant figures that you're waiting for a video to emerge of. And you can also add geolocation into. Just a very simple example. Um, we'll try this one is uh, for the Shenandoah National Park wildfires, you can create a column in TweetDeck using these keywords, uh, in quotation marks, Rocky Mount Fire, capital OR, has to be capitalized OR or else this won't work, uh, quotation marks, Rocky Mount Fire, or Shenandoah, et cetera, et cetera. You can then filter that for just video. So you just, you're only interested in video. Um, very simple to do so. If you create your search string, go to the top, say, showing tweets with videos, Immediately, you've got a live stream of video content coming through that you can check it out. You can, Claire's going to talk a lot more about how to verify that. Um, but now you have a live stream of video content emerging right in front of you. Um, as I mentioned, you can filter for tweets with videos. If you want images, you can filter with, by tweets with images. If you want periscopes, if you want live broadcasts from the scene, you can filter tweets with periscopes. So it's really, really flexible, very, very simple to set up. And what you need to do is, as I mentioned, one person is looking at Twitter. So use this in conjunction with your curated Twitter lists. So you're gonna have two or three columns. You'll have your curated Twitter list. You'll have your search column that's throwing up tweets with videos, and perhaps another search column that has tweets with images or tweets with periscopes, whatever you need. Facebook, still by some margin the most popular network, and has to be monitored in breaking news situations. Um, first thing I'd mention, native Facebook search is not very powerful. I would really recommend that people use signal.fb.com, which is a new tool launched by Facebook to help journal, a relatively new tool launched by Facebook specifically for journalists. And what signal.fb.com has is streams via Storyful and CrowdTangle, which surface the best content that's emerging. It's original content. You can check it out. You can reach out to the uploader, contact them, open a line of dialogue. It also has a very useful search function for both Facebook and Instagram. So it has everything you need in one screen. It's a one-stop shop for Facebook and Instagram content. And as, I, as I mentioned, you get your streams of content via Storyful and CrowdTangle too. So everything you need from Facebook and Instagram in this one place. Um, you have to apply for, for membership. So I really strongly recommend you do that. But if for whatever reason you don't have uh, access to Signal, using native search, 
simple thing, filter by latest, keep that tab open, and leave it perpetually update. So you're setting up processes in this first five, 10 minutes, so you have streams of content coming through that you can check into every so often. Um, another couple of tips that some people are not aware of. Um, if using place names, and this is particularly true in the uh, Middle East, uh, filter by pages. So let's say there's a town in Syria that it, you know, there's been an attack there or something like that. Get the local place name in Arabic, pop it into Facebook, filter by pages, and what you'll see is local and community activists who are based in that town. You're getting original content from a community page based on the town. You can check out the account history, but it's a very handy tip to find, um, as I mentioned, specifically uh, Middle East related content. Um, another little tip is, and this is particularly useful for US content, let's say there's a tornado in Oklahoma or something like that, go to a local newsroom's Facebook page, so the local ABC affiliate, check the visitor post section which appears on the left hand side, click in there, and here you can see content that's being shared directly with that newsroom through Facebook by people who live in the area. Local residents are going to have a connection with their local newsroom, they're going to be sending those guys stuff exclusively. It doesn't appear in searches, so this is the only way to see it. So go to the local newsroom's Facebook page, check the visitor post section, and you've got you know, another stream of original content that you can reach out on. So Instagram. Um, Instagram, you know, in terms of quality, not the best in terms of quality, and certainly the aspect ratio isn't particularly good either, but it's very, very useful in the early stages of a breaking news event, as it's updated on the fly, the app is very easy to use, uh, people tend to use it more commonly than Facebook, Twitter, etc. And geo metadata is very common, or reasonably common on Instagram, so it's easier to verify this stuff. Um, again, use Facebook Signal to search Instagram. Uh, this is your one-stop shop for Facebook and Instagram, so the person who's assigned, for example, to Facebook and Instagram is going to be using Signal. And again, you have your curated streams and you have your Instagram search function. If you don't have Signal, you can use GramFeed, where you can very easily search for geo coordinates. So you see in the bottom right here, I have a string of geo coordinates inputted. Uh, this is over Shenandoah National Park. And every uh, tweet that's geotagged within that area is fed into this stream of content on the right hand side. If I want to filter it down and just see the video, I press B. If I want to just see photos, I press P. So YouTube. Um, it's less popular certainly than the other platforms at this stage, but it's higher quality video. It's tends to be, if, if drone footage, for example, emerges from a specific area, it's often shared on YouTube. It's often high definition video, so you know, really, really good uh, quality. Um, but if you're using YouTube native search, what you want to do is you use local keywords, and you want to filter by upload date. Uh, you see it on the bottom right there, filters and upload date is, is highlighted. Uh, that gives you, again, it's, you're building a stream of updating content that you can check in every so often, see what's emerging, see what's being posted to YouTube. And, and that's the way you have to approach it. You're building streams in that first five, 10 minutes, building a stream on Facebook so you can see the latest stuff emerging, building a stream through TweetDeck so you can see the latest content emerging, and again, building a stream on YouTube so you can see the latest content. Um, that way you'll always be early to the content as it emerges. I recommend using Montage, which is a new uh, uh, tool that we've launched in conjunction with Google. Um, it's free to use for anyone, so it's, Good for two reasons. One, there's better search functionality on, on Montage. Uh, you can filter by dates more easily. Um, and you can also collaborate on ver verification with colleagues or even people outside your news organization. So you see a particular YouTube video that you, know, you, you can't nail down the date, you're not sure about it, you have question marks about it. You, wanna, you can, through Montage, create a project, invite a series of collaborators. You can all discuss it. You can mark out specific events that happen in the video, specific uh, landmarks in the video, and, and add comments to them, things like that. Um, so it's a nice, easy way to collaborate and verification in real time. And also follow YouTube Newswire at YT Newswire on Twitter, youtube.com forward slash newswire. Again, this is a storyful curated stream of content, but what we're sharing on YouTube Newswire is all original content from uh, uploaders. So if you go to YouTube Newswire, check it out, what you're seeing there is original content verified by Storyful, and it's an easy way to find uh, YouTube content in real time. Finally, uh, Reddit and live blogs. So often people are searching Twitter, they're searching you know, Facebook, Instagram, and so on. Not regularly are people thinking, kind of, I suppose, outside the box, things that are happening off social media platforms. But Reddit and, and lo local live blogs in particular are becoming an increasingly important thing to monitor in breaking news situations. 
I have an example here of the Le Soir uh, live blog during the Brussels attacks. What you find again, and similar to the visitor post thing I mentioned earlier, that local people tend to share their content with the news organizations they know and trust. So the Le Soir live blog was putting up original content that wasn't appearing anywhere else. They were crediting it, crediting it to its owners, but then Storyful was able to track back, find these people on social media, reach out to them, obtain the videos that way. So it's another stream of content, again, that you're monitoring, trying to find out, uh, trying to find videos uh, very, very quickly. Um, as I mentioned, videos frequently sent directly to local media and then shared in the live blog. So you're getting, it's not being shared on Twitter, it's not being shared on Facebook, it's being shared uh, to, directly with organizations and then posted on their live blogs. And what we often see now, in fact, almost all the time now, for a big breaking news story, you get mega threads on Reddit. Now, everything that is said on Reddit obviously has to be taken with a pinch of salt, but it's a very, very useful thing to monitor for early tip-offs on, on things that are happening. You also have people posting directly to these Reddit mega, uh, mega threads content they've taken themselves. So another platform on which you can monitor, see content emerge, and chase it down if, you, if you're interested. Again, unverified information, but potentially useful tips, and often links back to original content. And needless to say, be extra vigilant with information shared on Reddit. Um, there has been occasions, and I think one of the most famous cases was the Boston Manhattan bombing, where people tried to crowdsource you know, who is who the suspect, find out who, who the guy who carried out these bombings was. So a crowdsourcing mega threads happens on Reddit, and they identified the wrong person. Um, and these organizations, some of these organizations ran with that. So you have to be vigilant, particularly with names and identities as they're, as they're being shared. Just a couple of other free tools that I think are worth mentioning. Uh, Feedly, uh, at Storyful, it's basically an RSS reader, but what we've done at Storyful is we've built, um, we've gone back to our, our entire archive of contents back to when we founded the Storyful in 2011, and we've categorized all those YouTube channels into folders related to country. So I can go into Feedly, if something happens in Afghanistan, I go into my Feedly, click on Af the Afghanistan folder, and I have a list of uh, channels that we have verified from in the past that we're familiar with, we have contact details, and I can reach out and, and get the content if I need it. Um, as you can see up here in the top right, we have a, uh, a folder related to Decision 2016, the presidential election, so people who are traveling around following candidates on the campaign trail, very easy to click in, check it out, see if there's something there that we want to use, and, and reach out to the uploader. Storyful multi-search, free Chrome extension, very simple, but what it allows is the searching of multiple platforms at the click of a button. So you want to search, for example, Facebook and Instagram at the same time. You type in your keyword into Storyful multi-search, select Instagram, select Facebook, click search. It searches both platforms without needing you to go from one tab to the next. Just a little bit of a time saver. It saves you maybe five, 10 minutes uh, in a shift. Finally, Banjo, which is a paid for service at the premium level, but there's also a very useful free service at Banjo forward slash trending. And again, you're talking about original content that's being shared at the ground and almost all of that content is geolocated. So they're just some simple free tools that you can use to kind of discover content in real time. So Craig is gonna talk a lot more about debunks and hoaxes and fake content and all that. But a couple of things I did want to note, uh, particularly about breaking news, so you've set up your processes, you've got your tweet text searches running, you've got your YouTube searches running, you have journalists assigned to specific roles, you all know what you're doing, but you have to be extra vigilant these days because inevitably in any breaking news situation, within the first 15 to 20 minutes, you're gonna see fake content being shared. Most commonly, it's old content being shared as new, and that's what we saw in the Brussels attacks. Um, very early on, there was CCTV footage shared purporting to show the blast to go off in the metro station. It was a simple process to debunk it, but people were so eager to get the best content and share it and you know, get it out there that it was distributed by big news organizations. Uh, the footage that was actually shared was from Minsk in 2011 um, and caught a lot of people out because people are eager to, to be first to a great piece of footage. They want to share it. They see it being shared all over social media and think, let's go. But you have to be extra vigilant. Um, Major news organizations consistently caught out. I'm not going to go into specific details, but serious errors have been made by major news organizations in every major breaking news story over the past 12 months and, and f further back still. Uh, Brussels attacks, and I think Claire is going to mention some of the examples from Brussels attacks later on. The Paris attacks and the Umpqua College shootings. The Umpqua College shootings was a particularly egregious error in which a major news organization misidentified the shooter um, 
live on air for a period of about two hours. You're not just talking about embarrassment, you're talking about potential legal ramifications for you there. So you have to be very, very careful. And again, particularly careful with names and identities as they're shared. Brussels attacks is a perfect example of that, where there were so many identities and names being shared in real time by local journalists, local news organizations. A lot of them didn't match up to what was really going on. Um, as I mentioned, the next presentation from Claire is going to deal with how to verify this content you're finding in real time. Um, but think of this more as, as a checklist. What, what, do, what are the steps I need to take in that first five, 10 minutes? What are the things I need to set up in that first five, 10 minutes of a breaking news or, uh, story to ensure that I'm getting all the content I need and I'm seeing all the content that's emerging very, very quickly? The next step then, of course, is to verify it. So contacting eyewitnesses. Um, Look, breaking news situations can be very, very sensitive, and there's, it is a bit of a minefield out there when you're dealing with these eyewitnesses who are sharing content on Twitter, Facebook, and elsewhere. Uh, there's a very handy set of guidelines from Eyewitness Media Hub here on the right, but I'm just going to mention a couple of principles that I think are, are worth uh, raising. Obviously, be mindful of how you approach witnesses, but I think it's always good policy to take conversations off public platforms, if at all possible. Twitter DMs find the person on Facebook and message them on Facebook, find an email address and email them. Best of all, find a phone number and pick up the phone and call them. If you are picking up the phone and calling them, be wary of translation issues. If speaking to eyewitnesses, eyewitnesses for whom English is not a first language, it's very, very easy for things to be lost in translation. All of a sudden, without intending to, you've insulted someone or you've, you've made them feel uncomfortable. Um, a good policy to have is to have a list of people in your organization who speak specific languages. So if you need someone to pick up the phone and call someone in France, for example, you have a French speaker that you can reach out to very quickly and ask for help to do that. I would finally say mistakes can be made and probably will be made. There are going to be times where you reach out to an uploader and they don't react very well to your communication. Always be transparent, I would say, about what you're, what you're looking for. You know, I work for the New York Times and I need to use this on our website with a courtesy to you. Be sensitive, you know, don't say, hi, that's great. Your images are great. Can you take some video, as some people say, in breaking news situations? Um, be mindful of ownership. Every piece of content shared online is copyright, copyrighted. The copyright lies with the person who captured that piece of footage or that image. And finally, if you do cause upset unintentionally, and again, I'm emphasize take this off public platforms, just put your hands up and apologize to that eyewitness and say, look, I didn't intend to cause upset. We're going to leave you be. If you change your mind, you can come back to us at any time. Um, most people are reasonable. And if you apologize and if you hold your hands up, they're going to be reasonably OK with that. Um, and you have to understand, for a particularly high value piece of content, these guys are getting probably hundreds of emails, maybe even hundreds of phone calls, thousands of tweets. And it can be very overwhelming for someone who's caught in the, the wrong place at the right time, I suppose. So that is it for me. I suppose the last point I would say, think of this as like a checklist of the steps you need to take in a breaking news situation. So the things you need to do, you need to set up your Twitter list, you need to set up your tweet text searches, you need to set up your YouTube streams, your, you need to set up your Facebook streams, and you need to have people assigned to specific roles so that you're not stepping on someone else's toes. If you do that, you're going to get all the content that emerges very, very quickly, and chances are you'll be ahead of the game. Um, so that's it. Thanks very much. And any questions? I think there's a mic to be passed around if there are questions. And it works. Any questions? There is one that's come in from a viewer um, about sort of duplication of effort, I suppose. So they've asked how many staff should be allocated to just searching and monitoring online news. Is it something that everyone should be doing with their separate monitor? all day, every day? It depends on the size of the team, I suppose. I mean, at, at Storyful, and we're, uh, I suppose, a unique case. Um, we have you know, one person just looking at Twitter and TweetDeck for the whole shift, one person just looking at YouTube, Reddit, live blogs, one person looking at Facebook, Instagram. If you have the bandwidth to do that, it ensures that you're not duplicating effort. And I'd say one of the key things for newsrooms in a breaking news situation is that there is a massive amount of duplication going on. Because everyone, every journalist wants to be first to that great video, so they're all looking for the best, you know, the best piece of content. Chances are they're all doing the same thing. Um, it always helps to have, I think, and I'm talking about process and checklists here. At Storyful, we have a checklist, with our breaking news checklists. This is the, these are the ten things we need to do every time a, piece, uh, a story breaks. 
I think if you have those processes pre-arranged and pre-set, it'll minimize the chances that your, your team is going to duplicate effort. Now look, for example, in an organization like the New York Times or even Express team and a video team, there may be two people on both those teams doing, looking at the same things, but they're doing it for different reasons, so it's not quite the same. But uh, certainly if you're on a digital news desk and you're all working towards the same end, you have to make sure that you're not duplicating effort because it's, it's a real waste of time. Great, any other questions in the room? Well, in that case, we've got one more um, from an online viewer who is asking um, about how you then revisit eyewitnesses. Do you go back and, and how long do you keep the relationship with them once you, once you have received their content? It depends. Um, Storyful is a licensing agency as well, so on occasions we will license eyewitness footage. And when we do that, we have a kind of perpetual relationship with the uploader. So we're returning to them every month to discuss their footage with them. If we clear footage, we may or may not, not go back. Um, there are certain times where somebody puts up a video, gives permission to media organizations to use it, and then says, actually, I changed my mind uh, and take it down. In those kind of circumstances, we may go back to the uploader for, for clarity or for more information. But um, I suppose it depends on the circumstances. But um, not frequently, I suppose, is the, the short answer. Thank you very much. If there's no further questions, I think we'll go straight to Claire Wardle. Thanks, Joe. That was amazing. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you again, Adam. I think he's gone, but that was a ridiculous introduction. Um, okay, so I'm going to be talking about a verification checklist. So Joe's told you how you find this amazing content, uh, but how do you check that it's true uh, so you can run it? And the reason I use the word checklist is because actually, as an industry, we don't have a checklist that we can all say, yes, it's had two pairs of eyes, or yes, it has to reach this level before we run it. Instead, this is our checklist. We all say this cannot be independently verified, which is actually not very helpful to the audience. We've done research with the audience and they say, I don't really know what that means. And actually it's a lie because a lot of newsrooms are doing a lot of verification. It's just it hasn't reached to a level where the lawyers say, yes, we can hold our hands up and say it. So we often are using this, this cannot be independently verified. But I just want to talk about four examples where actually we often are very certain about certain elements, but there's maybe one element that we're not. But this is from Brussels, where we absolutely knew that the source, date, and location was all wrong. So this is David Clinch from Storyful actually calling out CNN, which I'm just going to do because it was so egregious, uh, it has to be said. There was a, there's a scraping Twitter account called Online Magazine, which aggregates, they just scrape other people's content. They did put this up and say unconfirmed, um, but CNN used it and they actually credited it to Online Magazine, which is obviously a scraping Twitter account. In 2016, we can't get away with using this kind of content in this way. And this was a particularly bad example. But this example, which you probably saw, was a Twitter video that was uploaded by somebody called Anna Orenheim. It got over 26,000 retweets. It got used everywhere. It was people running away from the airport. Now, in this situation, we could verify that this was the right date and it was the right location, but it was not the right source. If you're not aware of this story, six hours later, she tweeted, just FYI, this is not my video. I'm not in Brussels, which any journalist who'd done two minutes of searching would have worked out that she wasn't in Brussels. It was shared with me on WhatsApp. I don't have a name for credit, but please don't use mine. This got 10 retweets. So in this situation, this is still, I did a look yesterday, still lots of major news organizations running that video with Anna Orenheim as the credit, which is incorrect. So the, the issue here is we did know the date and location was correct. You'd be idiots to not run the footage while you're waiting to find out who the source is. But I think there's something about transparency around what we know and what we don't know. Here's one of my, uh, this is from the MH17 um, situation. There's a lovely, at the time, it was a 15-year-old boy. He used to sit at Schiphol Airport and take photos of all the planes that took off. He realized that actually this image that he'd taken was of MH17. So he tweeted out this image with, I don't know if you can see, but a Comic Sans font of his username because he knew that nobody would credit him. Actually, a certain news organization scrubbed that out because <laughs> it was so ugly. Uh, anyway, in this situation, we absolutely, we can verify the source, we can verify the date. We can never independently verify the location because all we've got to go on is blue sky and a plane. So there are certain situations where we just can't independently verify that, but yet we know the source and the date. This is, it's a year anniversary of Nepal. Often with natural disasters, uh, you can verify the source, you can verify the location, 
you can use Google satellite image to say where that is, but often you'll find during days where there's kind of five or six days of footage coming out, it's very hard to verify the date specifically. Because remember the difficulty with the date is it's not the upload date, it's the date that it was captured. So again, all those four examples, we knew certain elements, but we didn't know others. And I think just by saying this cannot be independently verified, we're doing a disservice to the audience in terms of what we do know. So the main thing I want to say when we talk about verification is, is it's a process. So people say, have you verified that? It's very rare that you can you know, stick a big green tick and say, yes, it's been verified. Often you're going to say, I'm in a process, and this is what I know, and this is what I don't know. So in this presentation, I'm just going to go through the five checks that you should be making. Firstly, provenance. Are you looking at the original piece of content? That example with Anna Orenheim is an example that we're seeing more and more of, of footage circulating via WhatsApp and other chat apps. And then finally, it will emerge on Twitter or YouTube, but it's almost never the person who originally created that content. Uh, WhatsApp makes it very difficult. Obviously, encryption is wonderful, but actually it's making it even harder to, to do any kind of verification on the content emerging from WhatsApp. Secondly, source, who captured the content? Not the person who uploaded the content, but the person who actually pressed click on the camera. Thirdly, when was the content captured? Again, you can get good upload data for things like YouTube and Instagram, but actually you want to know when was that footage captured? What was the time and date stamp? And location, where was the content captured? Again, there's good GPS um, uh, tools around things like Twitter, but actually you want to be able to independently say, using satellite imagery, this is where the person was standing and I can double check with them. And finally, motivation, which is increasingly becoming important as everybody can essentially be holding a camera. I used to work for UNHCR, we would train field workers to actually create eyewitness media, essentially. You've got citizen journalists who are, who are out there deliberately to, to capture a story, but you've also got just accidental eyewitnesses who just happen to be there. That's a big part of this, particularly in terms of labeling and being transparent with, it, with the audience about who it was that captured it and why they captured it. So firstly, are you looking at the original piece of content? Uh, the most simple but most important verification tool is uh, Google reverse image search because scraping is a big issue when it comes to eyewitness media. We increasingly have things emerge on Vine. They get dragged down from Vine and re-uploaded to YouTube. You get stuff on Periscope that's getting scraped and then repackaged into a, into a video. So scrapes are one of the most important problems um, and actually one of the most difficult uh, problems to solve, but it's all about provenance. So here's an example of Google reverse image search and how quickly you can use it to check, is this image of rubble around Nepal, uh, is this actually something I can use? So this is from Syria. In less than 20 seconds, we can see that the image was actually taken in Mali in 2012. You can right click, you can have a Chrome extension for reverse image search, or you can go to Google images yourself. And when it comes up, you get the little camera icon and you simply click on the camera icon and either paste the URL or you can upload the image yourself if you saved it. And here, ping, 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 all these examples are from 2012. So at that point, you can just say stop. We just know that this is not from today in Syria. And this is a kind of a dream verification moment when you know you, you can't go any further. If it comes back with zero, this has never appeared on the web before, that doesn't mean, amazing, we can use it. It means, oh, I've got to carry on doing more checks. Um, but Google reverse image search does not exist for, oh, sorry, before I move on, this Craig introduced me this to, the, to me the other day called RevEye. Uh, it's again, it's a Chrome extension. You can right click and it will allow you to do a Google reverse image search, but also TinEye. TinEye is another reverse image search engine. Uh, Sidral, Yandex, Badu. Yandex is very interesting. It's, if you're doing any work in terms of Russia and Turkey, uh, Yandex is a search engine that gives you more information. And even Street View, there isn't Street View for Google Street View, but there is for Yandex if anything happens in Istanbul. So understanding these different search engines is another really important part of the, the work that we're doing. But as I was saying, video doesn't have a reverse image search functionality. But uh, Amnesty built this tool called YouTube Data Viewer. And what it allows you to do is to take a YouTube video and you simply copy the URL into the Data Viewer and it gives you whole load of information on the left-hand side. But if you focus on the right-hand side, at the top, it gives you the unique identifier of the video, and it pulls out thumbnails. So all it's doing is finding thumbnails from the video and then allowing you to do a reverse image search on those thumbnails. So in this example, here's the unique identifier I was talking about, which I'll come back to in a second. By putting in that thumbnail, it pulls out all of these other examples. So you very quickly say, well, this is a scrape. There's other stuff online. Um, let's not use it. So although we haven't had the answer in terms of video reverse image search, this is the closest that we can get. And returning again to unique identifiers, 
you have unique identifiers on YouTube videos and Instagram photos or videos. If you put that into Google, it allows you to track where else that has appeared on the web. So here, by putting that unique identifier in, it shows me other examples of where this video has appeared on the web. So it's just giving me more clues, allows me to go down the rabbit hole and say, yep, this is not something I should touch with a barge pole, as we would say in my country. Uh, here's an example from Instagram of the attacks on the beach in Tunisia. Again, here is the unique identifier for Instagram. It's the collection of letters and numbers in the middle of the URL. Again, you put that into Google, you get all the places that that Instagram image has appeared previously. So you're getting more information that you can use. I wish there was a magic machine that you could feed in a piece of content and it would tell you, yes, this is the original. What you really want to do is speak to the source, get them on the phone and say, please, can you send me the original image? Uh, without that, it's very difficult to know that you're actually looking at the original. Here's some monkeys on a roof. If I was trying to work out whether these monkeys were real, uh, one simple and free tool is, is it true? So none of these tools that we're showing you, they're all free, which means none of them are perfect. But when you put them all together, they give you some pretty strong foundations to do your work. Is it true was uh, created by some people who previously worked at Photoshop. What it's doing is running six different forensic tests on your image. Now, this is just for images. Um, remember, for any social network, they rip out all the metadata on your photos and videos. It makes it too heavy. They don't want you to have the metadata, which makes it very difficult for verification. If you have the original photo and the person has sent you their monkey roof photo, you can then put it through, is it true, and it will run those different tests. The reason I show you this is it's pretty sensitive. So even the fact that it was emailed to me, I downloaded it and then uploaded it to, is it true? It says here, our forensic test suggests the file has been resaved since initial capture. So it's looking at issues like, like compression. It's looking at issues, has it been resaved? Uh, again, it's not perfect, but if you're working on a breaking news desk and you get an image in, it's a good first step. Secondly, source. Who captured the content? So there's a number of different kind of aggregator websites out there. PQ is one. Spokio is another. Uh, I say this publicly, in America, people give away a lot of data, so it's much easier to search for people in the US than it is anywhere else. So this is the San Bernardino shooter. Uh, you can find the address. Uh, if you have the, pr the pro version, it tells you things like the price of their, um, <laughs> price of their house, uh, telephone numbers, all sorts of things. Uh, so if you have a breaking news situation in America, you're on much uh, uh, better ground than in, uh, elsewhere in the world. Uh, Pipple is better internationally, but still it only, is only as good as how much information somebody has put out there. So you want somebody with a large digital footprint, and when you have that, uh, you're in a better place. Remember, you always want a unique identifier. So rather than searching on somebody's name, you're always better to search somebody's email address or telephone number or username in Google. The more uh, unique the information is, the, more, the better your results will be. This is Anna Orenheim, who keeps coming back in this presentation. It would have taken one search of her name to work out that she wasn't in Brussels. Uh, so there really was no excuse for not working that out more quickly. Another website is follow.me, uh, which allows you to look at somebody's Twitter account and it'll tell you how long they've been on Twitter. So this is lovely Joe Galvin. He joined Sunday, May 11th at 2.25, 2008, early adopter. Uh, so I think he's probably not a bot, uh, but also I like follow me because it tells you uh, when people generally tweet so I like this because it shows that Joe is a good boy and likes to get seven hours sleep every night and he doesn't often tweet in the middle of the night. So this gives me more of a sense that he's a human and he's a normal person. Another freakishly upsetting tool is graph.tips, uh, which allows you to search somebody's Facebook graph. Uh, essentially, everybody has an, their own username. So here, I would put in somebody's username. So if you look at anybody's profile page, it would say facebook.com forward slash Silverman Craig. And that's Craig's unique username. I put that in and it brings up his personal Facebook ID. And once I have that, I can look at the posts that the person's commented on, which photos is this person like, which photos have they been tagged in. Now bear in mind this is only public stuff, but it's actually amazing how much stuff, when people are commenting on public pages, um, how much stuff they have out there. Uh, again, if you're a journalist, you might want to go and check all your own privacy settings, but when you're trying to do verification, it becomes very helpful. So this is just a collection of some photos that Craig is tagged in, including one with a horse. Uh, there were worse ones, but I was being a good friend. Um, but again, always search yourself slash ex-boyfriends, just to see if there's anything out there. And finally, um, if you have a website, look up the domain name registration information. So the best one is whois.ican.org. And because this is me and I don't want to embarrass myself, 
Um, I have paid the extra $20 for privacy, which smart internet users do. Uh, there are people out there who haven't done that. And if they hadn't, you would have got my email address, my telephone number, my actual address, and my fax number. Uh, little secret tip, often people like me will buy clairewardle.com, but I might also buy clairewardle.co.uk, clairewardle.net, clairewardle.biz, because uh, it's a beauty queen in Seattle, and I do not want her to have my domain name. Um, I'm not going to pay the extra $20 for those other domains because I haven't got anything on them. However, you could potentially go in and find my secret information. So that's a top tip. Uh, domain names can be really useful for finding information about people. Date. When was the content captured? So this is an, an old example, but still a really important one. And actually, Maliki Brown, who has just joined your ranks, uh, he was the person who found this uh, back in 2013 when there was the chemical weapons attacks in Ghouta in Syria. Those chemical weapons attacks happened at 2 a.m. in the morning. Actually, every YouTube video is date stamped with Pacific Standard Time. So 2 a.m. in the morning in Syria was the previous day in California, which allowed Putin to say, no, this is all false content because the date stamp is wrong. Actually, it was because the date stamp was showing California time, not Syria time. And it's important to know that every social network has a different date stamp protocol, which is a massive pain. Twitter's date stamp protocol is the internal Twitter settings that you've set up. So recently I realized I was out of sync because my settings were still for London. I hadn't moved them to New York. Facebook's timestamp is based on your internal clock. So when you fly and, you, and it says, no, move your, your map, uh, it depends on what time your computer thinks it is. And then YouTube and Instagram are both Pacific Standard Time. So it's important to know that for all the different social networks. One day, maybe they'll all align and become friends, but I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. Another great site is Wolfram Alpha, which is a knowledge engine, and it allows you to ask what the weather was at a particular time. It's basically cross-referencing weather forecasts that are out there. So if we go back to the MH17 example, I can say to Wolfram Alpha, what was the weather in Amsterdam on July 17th, 2014? And it actually says here, rain, fog, overcast, cloudy, partly cloudy, few clouds, clear. It's a very European forecast, <laughs> four seasons in one day. Um, but actually, if I look further, the top chart says cloud cover. MH17 took off, hello, took off at 11.31 local time. And if I get my lovely arrow to work, hello, lovely arrow. It, could we kick something? <laughs> Nicely, lovely. So it took off at the lowest point of cloud cover. So you're thinking, well, OK, maybe that gives me more information. Again, none of this is absolute, but you're putting all these clues together on your investigation board. Potentially kick something else? Thanks. So EXIF data. So EXIF data is the metadata that sits around an image. We don't have EXIF data for video yet. We just have it for images. Uh, now, Flickr keeps EXIF data unless the, the person says no. Unfortunately, not many people use Flickr now in breaking news situations, which is a shame. But this is from the Boston Marathon, and you can see at the top it says taken on April uh, 15th, uh, actually up, uploads to Flickr on April 16th. So it shows the difference between the time it was taken and the upload time. It also tells me that the camera was a Canon digital something. Um, so the camera becomes really important, actually, because when you get the person on the phone, you can say, what camera did you take it on? Oh, it was an iPhone. Well, what type of iPhone? iPhone 5? No, it was an iPhone 6. So that knowing what kind of camera somebody was taking it on becomes important when you're actually talking to the source. Location, where was the content captured? Now, this is hat tip Andy Carvin. Here's an example that he found that was geotagged. So on Twitter, when you see the little peg, that means that either the computer or the phone had location switched on. Only a very small percentage, estimates between 1.5 and 3% of content on the social web has actual GPS located content. And this is an example of one where we can say this was tweeted from Yemen on the 6th of September 2015, and, and here's the tweet. The problem is this photo is not geolocated. This photo is a road to Basra, it's a long time out of date. Often people look at that and be like, oh, that looks like Yemen. Um, and increasingly with tools like Data Miner, where content just surfaces, and people say, well, I've put this, this kind of boundary around it, and anything within this boundary has been geotargeted. Yes, this tweet is geolocated, but the content isn't. So that's something really important to bear in mind. This is a photo of my front room that I took and posted to Instagram. And Instagram said, oh, are you in Morningside Heights? I said, no, I'm in Yemen. And so it published it saying that I was in Yemen. Be very wary with Facebook and Instagram because people can override where they say that they are. 
Uh, so there's something really to bear in mind on those, both of those sites. Even on the map, I used to really believe that the map on the app was only geolocated content. But some, uh, I did some experiments with my students last week and they're like, oh Claire, I've just uploaded a picture of Kobe Bryant and it suggested Lakers and it's posted it to LA, but we're sitting at Columbia University. And I was like, hmm. So we need to be comp very, very wary of Instagram and talk to them about how they're, they're geotagging their content. Uh, and this is an example, if you don't know, it's a good one, so we'll say it again. John McAfee, uh, on the run, nobody knew where he was. Vice managed to get an interview with him. And whilst interviewing him, said, can we take a photo with you? And he's like, yeah, sure, fine, not a problem. So it was published, not realizing that by publishing it, the EXIF data was still viewable. So his phone was an Apple iPhone 4S back in the days when we weren't quite as savvy about geolocation. And so the geolocation of that picture was visible, allowing everybody back at home to work out that John McAfee was in Guatemala. In fact, he was actually right next to that swimming pool. So EXIF data is incredibly useful when it comes to geolocation. But if you don't have EXIF data, um, you, you really want to be doing this independent verification using other imagery that's out there, both Google satellite imagery or Street View. Um, here's an example of a train. It says iDomini. I'm going to trust Instagram on, on this level to start the search. Even though all I can see is some train tracks and a police officer and some tents, actually it is possible in a pretty short space of time to find that uh, exact location. So here's the lat long. Oh, sorry. Here's the lat long. Um, and this is from 2011 on Street View. And if you cross-reference the clues, from the picture you can see the train tracks and you can see that they actually part here. There's not many moments on that particular track through Idomini where the train tracks do that. You've got two of those poles there and you might not be able to see there's a little grey box which tallies with a grey box there. You've got the little uh, siding there which is coming up with grass just there. Um, so at this point everything there says that's exactly where that picture was taken. So for all, most pictures or videos there are enough clues even though it doesn't look like it to be able to independently geolocate where something was. And you really want to put yourself where the, the uploader was standing in order to verify. So finally, why was the content captured? So there are a number of different examples here of people who are activists, who are just happen to be eyewitnesses, uh, or reporters themselves. You might have seen that example of when the boy was nearly hit with a baseball bat. And lots of journalists thought, oh, this is just eyewitness media because it was on Twitter. Uh, he was actually a photojournalist with a Pittsburgh newspaper and got very angry that everybody's like, oh, we don't need to credit him because he's just an eyewitness. He's like, no, I'm a journalist. And here's an example from UNHCR where there was a snowstorm last January. Uh, no professional photographers could get up there. And this was actually taken by a, a refugee. Um, and UNHCR put this up on their Flickr page. And right down at the bottom, it said, photo by Hani, a Syrian refugee in Lebanon. That in itself is part of the story, and I think we often forget who's actually holding the camera in the way that we would think about sources. We forget about it when we're talking about eyewitnesses. So finally, the verification process again. Provenance, provenance, source, date, location, and motivation. Remembering all the time, it's not just about the upload date or time. It's about when was it actually captured, who actually captured it. Which is why when you do the outreach that Joe was talking about, never say, can we use your picture? Say, did you take this picture? <coughs> because it's often the case that somebody's like, oh, no, it was my mate Barry. He took it, but I just put it on my Twitter account. It's amazing how often it isn't actually the person who uploaded it. Um, so in front of you, we have our verification guides, which are also available on First Draft News for photos and videos. And although it seems complicated, the idea behind this is on those five checks, you should be thinking through what do we absolutely know with certainty? What are we much less sure about? And particularly give it to editors, because often editors who are making the final call don't necessarily know as much about this. Oh, any questions? I'm ready again. Do we have any, any questions in the room, first of all? I don't think so. Um, I'm actually going to take this opportunity to swap flickers. I think I we're, having, <laughs> we're having terrible flicker trouble. Is that a thing? Flicker with an E, not a flicker without an E. Social um, media joke. So we're just going to swap those over. <laughs> um, there has been a couple of questions online. Um, one of them is to do with the very last thing that you spoke about, which is the verification guide yeah. and this idea that, you know, really to get to, get to green, you need to speak to the source. Yeah. Um, can you then trust that you, the person you're speaking to, you know, do you, there, there seems to be an, another layer of verification then, surely. 
Yes, no, that's a really good point. And Craig, I think, when he talks, is going to talk about how many people lie. Um, but what you're trying to do is cross-reference the information you have. So that's why knowing whether or not the, uh, what phone they took it on or what camera they took it on is really important to be able to cross-reference with what they're saying. Or if you've got Google Street View open, you're saying, OK, when you were standing there, what was across the street? And if they don't say Starbucks, uh, then, you, you know, so you're actually asking them questions based on the investigations that you've done. Um, so rather than just taking everything at face value, you're trying to cross-reference it against the information that you have. Great. And um, we actually had one question that came in a bit late for Joe about how you monitor the million plus tweets that make sense. Um, that, well, how do you monitor a million plus tweets to make sense during a breaking news event? I think you kind of covered that with TweetDeck. Um, but then if you add this layer of verification, are you expected to verify every single one of the items of content in this real time you're environment? You're only going to pursue certain amounts. Like, you're not going to be in trouble. Oh. I, I think he's got his mic on. Uh, you're only, look, there's going to be lots of content emerging, but you're only going to want the good stuff, the stuff that's valuable, the stuff that's useful. So you're not going to be pursuing every single thing that comes through, just the ones that you deem are, you know, worthy of pursuing. So you're kind of filtering down again after that first initial uh, filter, if that makes sense. Such a slick operation. Um, there's still things happening over there. Um, so I just have one more question then based on that, that kind of filtering process. Oh no, can I just say something? Yes. Well, well, only because I think when you do these presentations, and I can just see journalists being like, love, have you ever sat on a desk during a breaking news situation? How on earth are we meant to do all these things? And I think the reason that we talk through the checklist at this length is being aware of what can go wrong, but also the, you know, Storyful will talk to this. When you, on certain, like, pretty simple stuff, it doesn't take a million years to do this level of verification. It's just in your head you need to think through it. If you're geolocating an airstrike in Syria, it can take a lot longer and be more difficult. But I think when journalists say, we just can't be expected to verify this because it takes too much time, a lot of these checks don't actually take very much time, uh, and it's simply knowing what you're meant to be looking for, or knowing we can't get to that level yet and being more transparent about the audience about what we do know and what we don't know because the idea that we wouldn't have run that Anna Orenheim video because we knew it wasn't her because she wasn't in Brussels would be crazy for a news organization but we don't really have a mechanism to be more transparent with the audience even a kind of a visual grammar about what we know and what we don't know which might you know emerge in the next couple of years are we good to go we're good to go um, so, yes, thank you. We, we're going to launch straight into Craig's presentation so that we can keep our online viewers glued. Um, and then after that, there'll be a final round of questions. Um, so I will leave it to you to take it away. Hang on. The, the new flicker. <laughs> Number three. Thank you. Good luck. All right. Um, so, uh, so for about a year, I've been the editor of BuzzFeed Canada. We launched a little bit less than a year ago. Prior to that, uh, I spent a long time doing writing and research on verification, but I also ran a project um, researching how news organizations cover rumors online and how misinformation spreads. So I'm going to talk a little bit about kind of the players, the entities, the motivations, um, all of the things that come together to make up um, the fake news and the hoaxes and the things that we see spread and to get some lessons for all of you so that when you see stuff, maybe, you know, that antenna goes up. Um, so in terms of what we're going to cover, our clicker is, is not a friendly clicker. There we go. So I'll talk a little bit about the ecosystem. Like I said, the players. Like, what are the entities and the people that are pushing this stuff out there? Um, there are a lot of common types of fakes that we see online. Obviously, with us uh, at BuzzFeed, we see certain types that are kind of oriented and, and planned to go viral. So I'll walk through those a little bit. And then look at some of the motivations, um, why people create them, but also what they're thinking about trying to um, attack in people and trying to make people re how they're trying to get people to react in order to make them spread. And that will help you sort of dissect these things and think about, well, why would somebody have created this or why would somebody be sharing this? And then the last thing is just to pick a bit from Joe and Claire, the tools and the techniques they talked about that are really useful when it comes to this kind of stuff. Um, so to start, actually, I wanted to do, we'll do a little quiz. So I'll come back to this at the end. I'm going to show you three stories. I want you to think about whether you think these were real or fake. So the first one is, this is a report about an explosion on an oil pipeline in Saudi Arabia. Um, so this is a story um, that was out. People talked about it. It started to affect the price of oil. So do we think that one was real? Um, also, this man and his gigantic fish. Do we think this is real? Um, you know, this was posted on a Facebook page, so that's another option. And then the third one here is a report of the first human death caused by GMOs. Um, so we'll come back to those at the end. So those are three types of things that we see getting out there. Uh, and so to dig in on that ecosystem, as I was talking about, 
The first one is one that's probably familiar to a lot of journalists, um, which are the official sources of propaganda. So these can be governments and other entities. Um, and in this case, this is a, a photo that was distributed by the official news service of North Korea. And what they said they were doing was they were practicing a land invasion of South Korea. So it was meant to kind of be a bit of saber rattling. And they distributed, and a lot of news organizations know when it comes from the official news agency of North Korea, you have to give a lot of caveats and give that context for people. But a lot of folks still ran this image without thinking about it. And the image itself um, had a lot of troubling elements in it. The main thing being that the landing craft you're seeing here, um, most of them were actually cloned in Facebook. So they only had like one or two of these, and then they just put a whole bunch more in there to look a lot more menacing. And so even though the text around the image and some of the context about it was, was proper in terms of saying, well, this came from the state entity, the fact is the image itself still conveyed something that wasn't true. So we have to think about that as well, not just the words that we're giving context to, but you know, are we letting this image through? Um, this is another example with MH17. Um, obviously, there have been a lot of organizations trying to figure out, well, you know, how was it shot down? Who shot it down? Where did the missiles come from? Who was involved? Um, this is Elliot Higgins, who runs a project called Bellingcat. He's part of uh, First Draft Coalition. And he and a, a large group of people have been trying to sort of pinpoint exactly where the missiles came that shot down the plane. And they've been bumping up against um, the Russian ministry, who have been pushing back and saying, uh, you know, basically saying that it, it, you know, it, was, it was not rebel groups, it was no one affiliated with them, it was not a, a book missile launcher and that kind of thing. And so as the Russians have been putting out reports trying to counter what Elliot's been doing, it's been kind of a battle back and forth. And obviously the Russian operation is pretty sophisticated. They have a lot of kind of websites that are affiliated with them. They have large, uh, you know, armies of Twitter bots and other users that they push stuff out in. So it's not just, you know, the official press release anymore. It's actually very organized elements online, whether it's Twitter accounts or networks of interconnected websites and other things. Um, we also have, you know, forever we've had the individual hoaxers. And uh, so here are two examples. One up top here was from Hurricane Sandy. This would probably be familiar to folks here. This was an account that had a fair amount of followers. It had kind of a decent reputation on Twitter. It didn't just spring up as Hurricane Sandy came. Um, and it tweeted falsely that there was flooding on the New York Stock Exchange. And there were a bunch of news organizations that ran with this, that put it out there. And a lot of people assumed that it was true. Um, and until the New York Stock Exchange itself started saying no, and until people who were actually there went and saw no, that wasn't happening. But it got a lot of retweets and a lot of attention, and media picked it up. Uh, this gentleman in the bottom is named Tommaso De Benedetti. During the day, he is a school teacher in Italy. In his spare time, he likes to make fake accounts for famous people on Twitter and fool journalists with them. Uh, and this is what he likes to do. Uh, he does it in part, he says, to expose um, kind of the stupidity of the press. He actually at one point wrote and sold a bunch of fake interviews with famous people to a bunch of Italian publications. And the New Yorker exposed him for that. So not only does he do Twitter, he also makes stuff up. And these are often people who will say they have an ideological motivation. Maybe they want to expose um, how untrustworthy the media is. Sometimes it's just fun for them. I think for Comfortably Smug, it was just the moment they wanted to see what happened. And we have to be aware of that, particularly in breaking news events. Um, this is kind of another sort of the next level of hoaxing that we'll see. This was a video that was put up on YouTube. And in the video, it's supposedly kind of surreptitiously shot at a Shell Oil event to celebrate starting drilling in the Arctic. And so what happens in the video is they wheel out this cake that looks like an Arctic shelf, and there's kind of you know, an, an, an oil drill on top of it, and the drill is supposed to drill into the cake and cut pieces for everybody. And what happens is the drill actually you know, shoots stuff all over the place. So they're basically saying you know, they can't even drill a cake properly. What are they going to do in the Arctic? Uh, and so a bunch of people you know, covered this. It started getting some traction. And then the journalists who wrote about it got an email from someone saying, listen, I'm with Shell PR, and that video is a hoax. It was not our party. It's fake. And if you want to know about what we're actually doing in the Arctic, follow this link. So the link went to a fake website. It was a two-layer hoax. The first layer was this video that snared people into it. Then if you wrote about it or if you were wondering about it, maybe you got an email saying, if you've seen this, it's fake. This is our real site. And the site had crazy claims about what Shell was going to do in the Arctic. So we're starting to see a little more sophistication now. And they're even sort of setting up hoaxes to ensnare people who have the instinct to debunk things as well. Uh, so those are the individual hoaxers. On the next level here, there we go. Oops. OK, we have um, fake news websites. So we can see here, I'll go to the previous one first. 
There we go. All right, so these are three headline examples. These are websites that when you go to them, they look like a real news website. They have articles written in a traditional news style, um, but everything on the site is fake. And they exist really for financial reasons. Uh, people write articles that they think people will share, typically on Facebook. Uh, they get shared on Facebook, they go viral on Facebook, that sends traffic back to the site, they put ads on the pages with their fake articles. Um, so it's not a huge money-making operation, but there are some very committed people who are doing this. And you would be surprised how much this stuff can spread. Uh, so the first one up top, during, this, was, this came out when there was a real Ebola scare here in the United States, and it really, really spread to the point that local media in this area of Texas um, actually had to go out and debunk and try to calm people down a little bit. Um, so that one is feeding on fears that people have, and it really, really spread, not only in that local area, but in the U.S. overall. This one seems like a completely unbelievable, ridiculous thing, and it got hundreds of thousands of shares. Um, people really did believe that there were going to be six days of darkness, and it was a big hit for them. Um, the last one is kind of a classic, um, you know, false death stories about celebrities. M people will always sort of fall for those and share for those. Now, just as kind of the hoaxes evolve a bit, we're starting to see the fake news websites getting a bit wise and starting to do new things because, uh, you know, people start to sort of expose them and talk about them. So this one is uh, what I call kind of a local viral strategy by them. So what they're doing is they're taking one article and then they produce like 20 or 30 or more versions of it for different locations. And the idea being that anybody who lives in these locations, local news in these locations, will look at this and say, oh my god, Jim Carrey's moving to my town or where I grew up or what have you. And it's actually pretty effective. Like I've seen some of them in Canada even and they start getting around. Um, right now, because of Justin Trudeau, we see lots of Justin Trudeau fake news stuff going around because he's like catnip for people. Um, but this is, this is an example of they're sort of like, okay, you know, how do we get to the next level? How do we get shares that we might not have had before? And so they just clone these articles to, to get them locally. Um, here's another example. So this, is a, this was a very recent one. Um, the site is meant to kind of look like Huffington Post. I mean, anybody in news probably would know that's not Huffington Post, but it's kind of close enough for other people. And this is really appealing to passionate Sanders supporters. Uh, and so it's going right for people who are partisan, right for people who are very, very passionate about this. And what happens in humans is we tend to sort of lower our skepticism when something goes right to our core beliefs. So this was, as a strategy, it was very effective. Um, but two things to note about it. So one is they set up a specific website just for this, HuffingtonPost.com.co. Um, it's one guy who has registered tons and tons of domains for news organizations, including NY times.com.co, and he throws up articles on them all the time. Um, the Hugh Hefner one was like a one-off. It was like msnbc.com.co, I think, and gets shares on them, puts like three ads on the pages, and then we'll take it down at a certain point. So this one, um, you know, spread a little bit. That ad right there for National Report is another one of his fake news websites that he runs. So he's creating this, this kind of interconnected network. And uh, after this story went up, in addition to advertising for nationalreport.com, um, that story was aggregated by unitedmediapublishing.com, which as you can probably guess is also owned by the same guy. So it's like you do one article, you promote one site, you aggregate it on your other sites, you start getting this internet interconnected thing of traffic going on. And you know, for the average person, if they see it's, you know, oh, well, it's on this site and they're linking and citing this other site, you know, it's going to get past a lot of people. And unfortunately, they do get past journalists too. Um, you know, the other key role in this, uh, folks, are uh, unintentional propagators. So these are well-meaning people who just share things and push them out there, and that really causes them to go viral. And so this is a case, you know, this is a famous fake photo from Sandy, where the guy shared it and then realized, oh no, this has almost 100,000 shares, and I know it's fake. So he posts that comment, but when I took the screenshot, it was already at 300,000 shares. So like, Genie is out of the bottle, 200,000 more shares after he sort of tries to flag it down for people. Most of these folks are well-meaning, you know? Um, and then there's news websites. So you remember this story? Uh, this was when I was doing uh, my research project, and this was a story that came out. She did an interview on a, a Florida radio station, and it got picked up everywhere. And what's notable about these three headlines is they're all talking about her as if it's a done deal and she actually does have three breasts. And so this is one of the things I saw in the research is that when you have somebody making a claim or there's unverified information, a lot of news websites will actually write the headline, specifically the headline, as if it's true. Um, a lot will sort of do allegedly claims, that kind of hedging language. Um, and, uh, and so this spread a lot. And in fact, it was written up, uh, the research I was doing was written up on the New York Times website. And it showed from the data we had collected that the amount of social shares for the stories that claimed it to be true were far higher than those that ended up debunking it. Um, and this is a little bit more of the data that I had. 
um, showing that you know it was 275,000 shares or so for articles, 18 articles that were like, yep, she has it, it's true. Then we, you know, the debunking started to come. Those who are in the middle of, well, she claims and this kind of thing. So the message here really is, is you know, there's a lot of unverified stuff that gets out there. Your standards are very high. You don't put a lot of unverified stuff on your site. That's one of the things I saw in the research. Um, but when, you, when you're making that decision, like you have to think about the framing of it and the language you use. And you also have to think about going back once it is proven true or proven false to kind of close that loop for people. So here are, here are some of the fakes that we see a lot online. Um, you may not encounter these a lot in your work, but you can see sort of some of the motivations and thinking going on here that may be at play in other kinds of stories you're looking at. Uh, there's often the, the fake heartwarming or outrage-inducing receipt, um, like the service person who doesn't leave a tip because they serve the country. Um, or there's a lot where you know, people just write something homophobic on the receipt, or it might go the other way where it's something really heartwarming. Um, these are often hard to track down, if, especially if you don't see the name of the restaurant on it or what have you. Um, so those are something that we're really wary of. Just any you know, piece of evidence that seems to be floating around the web, if you can't figure out where it came from, obviously you need to have a huge amount of skepticism about it. Um, crazy, disgusting stuff found in fast food. This was not a rat, um, in spite of what the person thought. And, uh, and so these tend to spread very quickly. I think there's like an innate fear and disgust thing going on. Disgust is a very powerful emotion for sharing. So when people tap into that, it really tends to work. Uh, people who uh, tweet uh, incredible scenes, remember this, a guy who said he was on a plane on Thanksgiving, got into an epic note uh, passing argument with a woman named Diane. And it was written up. Uh, and he said it was real when people reached out to him. And then like a day later, he said, no, it's not real. And you know he was he was a producer uh, and a writer in Hollywood, uh, so you know sometimes that's sort of a hint that well maybe they're just telling a story. Um, and to give you another example, this is one that was very frustrating for us. So there was an amazing uh, like eBay type ad that went up in um, Germany of a guy who was getting divorced and cut all of his property in half to sell it. So he was saying, well, I own half of everything, so I'm just going to cut everything in half and sell it. So he had all these ma amazing pictures up. So we have, we have an editorial team in Germany, and they reached out to him, and they reached out to the site, and everybody's like, yeah, it's real, it's real. So we wrote it up initially saying this guy claims he's done this and that kind of thing. And then it turns out that, no, it was actually just a, a publicity stunt for the classified site. And like even their, their PR agency, the company, all of them had lied, straight up just lied. So at that point, obviously, we change it and, and say that. But uh, you know, it was an ad campaign, sorry, for the divorce lawyers, not the, the classified site. But there are people who, who will completely lie. And you know, if you write about it and you put the hedging in, at a, if, and it turns out to not be true, you have to go back to it. Um, this is very common. Claire, I think, mentioned this. A real image, um, but from the wrong date. So this was an image shared a lot during Hurricane Sandy, where people said, this is at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, and they're standing on guard during a hurricane. That is the location, but it was not taken during Hurricane Sandy. And it got to the point where actually you know, the institution itself had to say, listen, um, this is a photo from today. Uh, and it was, again, a lot of news organizations have been sharing it. So real location, real content, but wrong time. Um, this, so one of these is an image from uh, Venezuelan state TV saying, here are the weapons we have seized from the rebel groups. One of them is an ad on a gun store's website. Uh, a photo from a gun store's website. So they just took it and they put it on TV and said that it was the rebels. So again, just finding an image and completely changing the context on it. Uh, if you remember this one, the way they put it together was a regular image of the Statue of Liberty, but this amazing cloud from a storm in Iowa. Uh, and so you, know, you, you see people doing these composites uh, a lot. And of course, a famous example is the street shark. You guys remember the street shark? So anytime there's a hurricane, the street shark makes an appearance now, Hurricane Sandy, Hurricane Irene. I think Irene might have been the first, at least the first that I saw. Um, and here's where the shark came from. Really impressive photo of itself uh, from South Africa. And so now these, some things have become almost memes. It's like you know people are going to do it. Um, but it also it creates that noise in a really intense breaking news environment. Uh, we also see uh, things that are our projects, things that are staged being presented as fact. So this was a photo that the BBC actually ended up running. Um, and it's, it, they reported it as a boy lying between the fresh graves of his parents. And, and it's, it was actually an art project. Uh, ditto for this flooded McDonald's, which circulated around Hurricane Sandy. So you know, doing that reverse image search, really, really important. Uh, and then we also see like, the completely ridiculous ones, like Godzilla coming ashore in New Jersey. Uh, and and you know, this, so this goes to kind of that hoaxer mentality. 
Um, I don't think the person who created this actually thought some people would think Godzilla was coming ashore. Um, but, and, and this is, we'll talk about this a little more in a second, but you know, the motivation here is really key. We think of any breaking news event as a breaking news event. For other people, it's just life, you know? And they're not thinking of it in terms of news and journalism. And they're, they are feeling stress. Um, they may not have all the information they want. They might be worried about loved ones. They may be just sort of sitting there wondering what's going on. And this is an outlet for them. Um, it's a creative outlet. It's a way to blow off steam. They're not necessarily trying to fool us a lot of the time. It's just a way for them to kind of be part of an event. Uh, and so we have to keep that in mind. We think of things from the news perspective. The average person, sometimes it's just entertainment or fun. Uh, here's our friend Tommaso De Benedetti as the Pope. So, you know, fake Twitter accounts, uh, the fake was not originally on there, obviously. Uh, and, you know, so using some of the techniques that uh, Joe and Claire have talked about in order to kind of dig in on the account and the history and all that is really essential. Uh, you guys might remember this. Somebody made a fake New York Times website and put a fake op-ed from Bill Keller rethinking um, the, the view of WikiLeaks. Uh, it, it fooled a lot of people, and it's very easy to clone websites. There are even tools that will do it for you. Uh, and this is our, our friend from National Report who runs a network of fake news websites. So this is what a lot of people see. And this site um, is really oriented to people who are more right-leaning in their political views, and it runs a lot of articles that will align with what they think. Uh, and, and so this goes to the kind of spreading piece of it is, you know, what are they going after and why do things spread? And the first part of it really goes to when we have strongly held beliefs, so it could be politics or other things in our life, um, our level of skepticism goes down. And this applies to journalists as well. We always think like, no, not me, I'm, I'm able to separate that. But National Report is really going after this. They're, they're writing anti-Obama stuff and what have you that people who are, already don't like him or maybe really like Donald Trump are going to read and it reinforces what they think. It literally it, it re like releases positive things in your brain and you are inspired to share it. So a lot of times they're going for ideologies and, and point of view things. So be aware of that when you're seeing things. The other piece of it, which I hinted a little bit um, around kind of Godzilla and all that, is when we have uh, situations where there are a lot of fear, uncertainty, where there's a lack of information, our natural response as humans is to try to fill in the information gaps. So we'll try to talk through something with friends or what have you, and maybe we'll come up with a scenario well, to explain this thing we don't know about, and that can actually start a rumor. So uh, rumors are its a very natural part of, of humans. It's a way we deal with these kinds of uncertain situations, and it's not always a malicious thing. Uh, so when you see things that seem like rumors, think about what that rumor might be doing for someone. Does it give them a sense of comfort? Does it help explain something they can't explain? Uh, these, are all, uh, these are all things that would help explain a rumor, and if you can think about the origin of it, then you can maybe get into the mindset of where, where it started. Um, so understanding that's really important. And the third thing being, sometimes people are just like they're trying to entertain themselves. It's, and they think it's harmless, but it sort of gets in, in the noise, creates noise for our work. Um, all right, so the last thing to quickly wrap up here before we go back to our quiz uh, is for spotting a fake, you know, I'll reinforce what's been said already. You've got to find that original source. Um, if you see this news article up somewhere and it's making a claim about something, what sources are they citing? Really, really basic journalistic stuff. But uh, again, people will think, well, it's on this news website. Um, I'll just take it from there. You have to track it back. Um, the about page of some of these sites will actually just straight up say, this is a fake website. Um, this is a satirical website. And it's amazing how many people do not just go to that about page. Some of them will not do it. Um, and in those cases, you know, the who is search that Claire talked about is usually helpful. They will often have their privacy settings on, but one thing that you may want to compare is, you know, if it's HuffingtonPost.com.co, just see if the who is settings are the same as the actual HuffingtonPost.com website. Is it an offshoot of them? In that case, you know, you knew it looked different enough, they're probably not, but a who is search can sometimes be really revealing. Um, the other thing is to, like, just completely dissect the thing. So if there are names and places, um, and links and company names as well as people names. You just Google and dig into all of these things and just pull the thing apart. If they have links in there, you follow those links and you go back through it. So you, you just, you know, it's really, really basic reporting stuff, but again, it sometimes get over, gets overlooked. You want to compare and see if anyone else is reporting it. And then the last thing is, you know, since now we understand a little bit about, you know, why rumors emerge, why people spread them, um, understanding a little bit about the psychology of us tending to pass on things that align with beliefs and believe them a little bit more, you can maybe use that to unpack things a little bit when you see them. Um, all right, so we're going to get to our final thing here. Um, so by a show of hands, do we think that the oil pipeline 
exploded in Saudi Arabia? Who thinks that that took place? See, this is what always happens. Everybody's like, I'm not putting my hand up. <laughs> it's, it's much safer just to be skeptical, right? This is the story of journalism. Um, so uh, in this case, it's not true. Um, now, there was an explosion. It was a pipeline, but it wasn't an oil pipeline. So that usually upsets people. They're like, that's not fair. Uh, and uh, so, but the really interesting thing, thing about this is that it, it did, had no effect on the oil supply from Saudi Arabia. It affected the rumor of this and the misinterpretation of this affected the price of oil for I think it was about 10 minutes or something like that on the stock market. So you can see the power of these kind of rumors and this kind of information as it flows. Uh, all right, so our second one here was our friend uh, with the fish, which we'll get to in a second. OK, thank you. Uh, was the fish real? Anybody think the fish was real? You're all so safe. Somebody, even, you nodded to me. You think the fish is real? It's real. See? Good. There you go. Everyone else, get out. OK? Uh, OK, the last one, uh, first case of death by GMO food. Does anybody? Think that one's credible? OK, some heavy skepticism on that, and you're right. That was from a fake news website. Um, and you know, so again, like who, who would be inclined to share that? Well, potentially uh, folks who are really anti-GMO would be inclined to share that uh, and say, see, I've been right all along. And so again, it reinforces what they believe. So um, that's what I wanted to run through. I would love to take any questions. Does anybody have anything they're wondering about? Jenny, do you have anything from our friends on the internet? We do nothing for you. Oh, well, <laughs> fine. <laughs> but they are, they're on a delay, we've learned. So that's perhaps why. Oh. So they're probably going to come in later on. Um, but we did have one that um, came in saying, it's very easy to modify EXIF data. So why should we rely on it for verification? Yes, for all of these things, there are very smart people that can change this. And EXIF data, you can change. So as I said, with all of these tools, none of them independently should be used in isolation. Um, but it's a case of saying, actually, in breaking new situations, most of your eyewitnesses are not doing that. But from a hoaxing point of view, yes, anything. People can, can do all of the things that uh, Craig has just talked about. So none of these things should be used by themselves. And EXIF data, there was a case, actually, with the meteor strike in Russia where uh, the Guardian newspaper was running a video of a dash cam video, and the person's internal VCR was saying the 31st of December 1999, and it was just running and running. And people on the Guardian were like, oh, Guardian, you idiots, look at the date. And they were like, no, the date was internally wrong. This meteor strike was actually today. So it happens on both sides. Uh, but no, it was a very good question, person on the internet. Uh, but yes, people can shift these things, but most people aren't doing it. But there are always those people. No point sometimes. of me. I didn't no, not anything. you, but you like them. Uh, the other thing on, on the exit question is um, it's also, that's okay, I'm still on, the, uh, like the quality of the size of the image file they sent you. So like, it's true, someone who's very savvy can manipulate exit data, but if you're trying to get the original image of something and they send you this, and it's like three megabytes, um, you know, for them to produce a high res image of that breaking news event, and be able to fake ESIC data, it's possible, but like you've got to take that into account when you're looking at it. So you know the images that are going to be online are going to be really low resolution. They're going to have all the metadata stripped out. They're going to be small files because they've been compressed. If somebody sends you a really high res photo that is of that scene, you know the chances of them being able to replicate that photo in order to fake EXIF data, in some cases, like that's it's not very likely. So just keep that in mind as well. No idea what Mike's saying to you now. Apparently, this is fine. Thank you very much. Okay. Craig. Um, I'll take the flicker. The yes. Dastardly good, flicker. Good luck with it. And do one final thank you to our online viewers for watching. Um, I hope it's been valuable. I know that you know we've we've had a bit of a delay. So if there's any questions that come in now, the sessions are over. Then obviously keep tweeting them, and we'll keep replying as much as we can. One thing I wanted to uh, point out was one of our coalition partners is called Medan. Um, they are based in San Francisco and they create lots of brilliant technology around this. And at the moment they're working on trying to create a visual language for identifying hoaxes and fakes online. So they've kind of come up with this sort of fun meme buster or hoax buster. We'll, we'll tweet out the appropriate link. Um, but that's a way that actually users and audiences can start to take part in this debunking process and actually start to, to you know, mark their own when they see something that's fake or they've heard that it's fake, they can mark it themselves to try and slow this spread of misinformation which is becoming such a problem that Craig's highlighted. So it's well worth checking that out. But all of the things that we've discussed today, um, we're going to collect them into some, you know, an article full of links, and we're going to edit the videos down. So if you didn't catch it from the beginning, you'll be able to recap. 
But um, that's all from us, I think. So thank you to all online. And we're all going to have a cup of coffee here. So uh, yeah, thank you very much. <laughs>